thanks for coming out, everybody. It's, you know, last night at the meeting, it was really wonderful just to see how many people have gotten so involved in this discussion. I can't think of many other places or settings where, where so many citizens are so concerned about something that's so wonky. And so the talk that you're going to get tonight is going to be somewhat wonky. It's going to be in the details, and I'm going to try and walk you through the models that we put together. So I'm going to start by telling you a story of how the group came together. I've supported clean energy action and renewables, yes, in the past, but I'm not really an active group member. I'm not part of the steering committee. And Frank is in a similar situation. I think Frank will tell you his perspective when he came in and then what he thinks now and how that's evolved as he's looked at it. So really, it's can we have it all? And rates, reliability, and renewables uh, really summarizes what we're looking for. And, and I'll show you how we've taken a look at that. So you heard a little bit about me, Caltech. I became active in energy systems in 2005. I've been in the area here for about 20 years. I do a lot of modeling and supervise people doing modeling. We build the Sterling engine, and that's a complicated thing that requires models to plan before you build it. So I know what they can do, and I know what they can't do. <clears throat> the one thing you know when you use a model is whatever your model result is is exactly where you won't be. You'll be close, <laughs> but you won't be exactly there. But the key to modeling is to really get good assumptions going in. Um, I've been very interested for a long time in how far can you really practically push renewables penetration on real grids. It's something that I think is a really important question. A lot of good people have worked on it. I'm also interested in how the grid flexibility of natural gas versus, say, coal or nuclear impacts that you know, penetration. What does that do to the cost? Um, and Ken Regelson's a friend of mine. We have lunch every quarter or so just to touch base with what's going on. And so this story really starts at a lunch between me and Ken Regelson in December of last year. Um, context, I think you all know the Excel franchise agreement um, was suspended, uh, expired rather, and the replacement financing passed, so we didn't renew. We have some time to think about what we want to do as a community. And Ken told me that, that uh, <coughs> Renewables Yes was looking for load data for Boulder to be able to start doing a spreadsheet model for what energy mixes could look like, and Excel would not provide it. Um, Excel claimed not to be able to get it, and I found that to be a little hard to believe. If I ran an electricity system and I didn't know how much power was running through my substations, I probably couldn't do a very good job of balancing load with generation. So. <coughs> Uh, Ken at that launch suggested that Fort Collins was a city quite a bit like Boulder, about the same size, got a university there, got a hospital, you know, about the same mix of businesses. So we're like, well, I wonder if we can get Fort Collins load data. <clears throat> so load data means how much is consumed in that community at every hour of the day. And modelers like to start with an hourly model. You like to know hour by hour because you know, all that varies, <clears throat> time of day. Cooling loads are high in the middle of the day. You don't have very much going on at night. So anyway, <clears throat> I got on the email form and I wrote to um, the PRPA, which supplies Fort Collins, as well as writing Fort Collins. So it took me two emails in six days, and I had 2010 load data for Fort Collins on an hourly basis. Woo. So I was like, kind of interesting, they know theirs. Huh, I bet Excel might know theirs. But anyhow, we can get started with this. So we knew about what Boulder's load was just from talking to various people. We took that Fort Collins load data, said we can scale this to what we know Boulder's peak load to be. We expect the profiles will be a lot the same. What should we do now? So I talked to Ken. Ken talked to Tom. I expected the first meeting to have four people and to really just talk <coughs> tech wonky details. Well, it had 15 people. And eventually this group grew to about 30. We had some meetings with 20 people. And I had to think about what that meant because it meant that this was going to be more than just a little modeling core group. And it offered a great opportunity because among those people who came to that first meeting were some people who work in wind, some people who work in solar, some people who work in generation utilities. And so we could actually ask some questions and run our numbers past this group. So I used the larger peer group. We all organized ourselves into kind of, we will review the assumptions, we will review the, the inputs and make sure that those are good, and then a small core team, which always does all the hard work, will do the hard work. And so six months of that has happened. Um, and the other thing I want to emphasize is that we don't have an agenda. My agenda going in was definitely not renewables, yes. 
It was definitely not the city. It was definitely not Excel. I was curious. I wanted to know, more importantly than anything, what's the right answer? And uh, that drove me the whole time. And, and it's been great working with them because there are some other people who feel that way in the group. There's some people that have an agenda. It really helps balance out you know, anybody's preconceived notions from taking over. <coughs> so tonight, I'm going to introduce the, the teams. I'm going to talk about the tech modeling team, the approach and the results. This is mostly on the generation side. Frank is going to talk about the financial modeling team, the assumptions and the, the process that goes on there. We'll each give you one slide of our personal conclusions after we've, we've reviewed all this, and then questions and discussions afterwards when we're done with that. Does that sound good to everybody? Yeah. Great. Okay, so there's that first meeting of the technical modeling team. We ultimately ended up with a little more than 30 people who were following uh, progress. We had um, five to eight people typically would come to the weekly meetings. Our first step was to choose the scenarios that we we're going to model because you've got this wide world. It's like, how do you pick how much natural gas, how much wind, how much solar? So we talked through how we do the scenarios. Second was to define assumptions, cost assumptions, economic assumptions, and so on. And third was to develop this uh, technical model. And, and there's a story behind that as well. And there were really three or four people that put in a lot of work. First, we have to say Tom Asprey put in a ton of time. It was his full-time job for, for many, many months. He was helped a lot by Lisa Buchanan. Lisa went and did a lot of legwork. She would do scenario runs. <clears throat> and then uh, Peter Lilienthal, who has come in. Peter, wave. Peter uh, helped bring our modeling tool out of NREL and has turned it into a commercial product, Homer Energy. Peter gave us invaluable peer review. So when we think we were done and things look pretty solid, Peter would come in and say, oh, no, gosh, what were you thinking? So we go back and we take that and we, we uh, adjust. So anyhow, there's some faces that are behind this presentation, and the work is a result of, of the whole team. On the financial modeling team, again, all volunteers, not quite as big. You know, running spreadsheets is a little bit more, you've got to have particular uh, uh, constitution for that. Um, <laughs> it had a few, a handful of regular meeting attendees. Um, and this is the way our two teams are linked. We would come up with a cost of generation model. Okay, so we, I'll show you that we have tools where we can look at financing and so on, but, but that's back checked by uh, Frank and his group at a much more refined level of financing. So we hand generation costs to him on a per kilowatt hour basis, and he can take and propagate that through a whole municipal utility cash flow, okay? And so we start on the uh, technology and fuel end through electricity <coughs> and rates, and then Frank takes it from there and does a plan, which looks somewhat like the RBI business plan. So you'll see some stuff that probably, if you've looked at the documents, looks familiar. Um, uh, Frank's model uses a 30-year model for utility operations, so 30-year bonds, um, and then also uses Excel PUC data. The PUC Public Utilities Commission has a lot of information about Excel's operation that's publicly available, and we've used that for a few different things, which I'll talk about. All right, diving into where it gets wonky. Okay, just uh, one quick question, you know, that was in the press the other day, and I think Frank commented about it. They said. Uh, if you don't have 15 minute data, you know, it's not good for a system as big as Boulder. And then Frank or somebody said that our log data or every hour data was whatever it was. Could you just tell us that so we, uh, again, so we can track it? It'll come up shortly, okay, but, but I'll, I'll, it'll come up in a couple slides. But, but the answer is you used appropriate you know, I'll tell you what the answer is in just a couple slides. Okay. That's all right. <laughs> so the, the key requirements that we had is it has to be fully reliable. So what Homer does is it balances uh, generation with load. And that it just requires within the software that no matter what happens, you have enough generation. And I'll show you how we can do that. Um, and this is the key thing for me philosophically and for the whole group philosophically, was we have what we call Boulder as an island, okay? And the key thing is whatever solution we come up with must be scalable up and down. 
you want to be able to take the same mix of renewables and gas generation and be able to build a whole grid across all of Colorado that ran that way, or in a small muni somewhere else. <coughs> in other words, building a big um, wind farm and having it lean on coal isn't what we were willing to do in this model. So what you will find in this model is the, the model, the grid that we design, will fully supply everything that it needs to do. And that's a good fit with Homer, because that's what Homer was originally intended for. Um, minimize CO2. <clears throat> maximize the grid's ability to accept renewables. And there's, you know, if you have a lot of base load that's nuclear and coal, that, that can prevent you from doing that. And minimize the electricity rates. And I'll talk about Homer helps us to do that. But our key assumptions were we must be conservative to the point where we expect people to say, we don't think you've thought about this enough, we don't think you're conservative enough, so we will make the most conservative assumptions that we think are reasonable. And most of our generation pricing comes from Excel Public Utility Commission um, filings. So we use their assumptions on things like heat rates and so on. Um, we will include transmission costs for wind because the wind around Boulder is not good enough. We'll have to buy parts of wind farms in the plains if we're going to do it. So you have to pancake that transmission cost on there. And require reliability per the FERC rules. Okay, so another thing that Homer, as I'll tell you about, uh, enables us to do is not only do the current rules, <coughs> but adopt rules for systems that have high penetrations of renewables already on them. So when we talk about reliability, we are accounting for fuel costs on, on a, a basis that's more than is actually required here right now. That's another level of conservatism. And then list at the end all of the things that we haven't taken into account which are only going to improve rates. 